I should start by um, thanking Alexander as well. Uh, Alexander and Brittany in our programs department more or less make the symposium happen. Um, uh, I helped figure out whom we might invite. Um, but all of the logistics, all of the invitations, all of that uh, is organized by them. And it, it's, it's really gratifying at the museum to work so closely with the education department and to create these programs together. I'm also going to spend a lot of time today talking about our installation of the exhibition here um, on the heels of it having been at the Meadows Museum in Dallas and at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And although I don't know that any members of our installations crew is here, I'd like to acknowledge just how good they are. Um, we had conservators from the National Gallery saying this is the best install telling me this is the best installations crew that she's ever worked with. She's at the National Gallery. And I think again and again, <laughs> I think again and again, the people who have seen the exhibition in more than one venue, including the people from the National Gallery, including our speaker, Barbara Van Bargen, uh, I think feel that ours is by a substantial margin the most compelling of the three installations. So, um, you know, these guys work behind the scenes. You don't ever see them, but they really are um, a, a special group of people. You'll actually see them tonight, because I, or this morning. I'm used to giving talks at night. It's a little off-putting. You'll see pictures of them this morning um, a, as I show the installation. I thought, though, that I would begin with the beginning, because I know that many of you have already seen the exhibition, but I trust that some of you have not. So I thought I would start with a very general introduction to the tapestries, to the idea behind the exhibition, um, and then turn to some details about the conservation that leads to the exhibition, and then, of course, our installation, answering the, the, the questions that I keep uh, having put to me in, as, the, as the show comes to its opening. In 1471, King Afonso V of Portugal set out to invade two cities in northern Africa. This is a 15th, uh, this is a 16th rather than 15th century map. It's a nautical map, um, actually on loan from one of our trustees, Mike Stone, who has his own map and atlas museum in La Jolla that some of you will have visited. He's lent us this map, um, and we've taken a detail of it and put it on the floor of the gallery as well because it helps g orient you um, with a nice historicizing flavor. So we have, of course, well, we would if the, there we go, the laser pointer. We have the coast of Portugal here. Here is Lisbon at the mouth of the river. Um, and the Portuguese sailed out into the Atlantic, past the Strait of Gibraltar, and invi invaded the cities of Arzila, or Asila, and Tangier right on the coast. The idea here would be one to uh, more or less control traffic into and out of the Mediterranean. You ask, well, you know, why, why are the Portuguese bothering? What's the point of this, of this invasion? And there's, uh, there are a number of reasons for this. One is you have to keep in mind, we're in 1471, where not only 20 years before the discovery of America, but we're also 20 years before the reconquest of Spain is complete. At this point, 1471, you still have the Moorish kingdom of Granada down there in the south. Um, it's not such a distant memory from the time when all of the Iberian Peninsula, or virtually all of the Iberian Peninsula, and all of Portugal had been under Moorish rule, had been under Islamic rule. And the reconquest is still very much in the minds of people. Portugal's standard at this point shows castles that represent the, the cities that had been captured back from the Islamic rulers over time. So to some extent, it's what a good Christian prince does. He goes and vanquishes the infidel. And I think that's the terminology that would have been used at the time. It's also the beginnings of that colonial expansion to which Alexander just alluded. Um, and uh, that has as much to do with trade and wealth. Uh, the trade routes from the east came through northern Africa and stopped basically at Tangier. And so the Portuguese are trying to tap into the wealth of the Orient by taking these cities as well. There's also a fairly significant grudge that the Portuguese hold against these people, but I'm going to leave that um, for Barbara to discuss in a great deal more detail. The point, though, is that the campaign was a success. And to celebrate his heroic deeds, the king commissioned the tapestries that you'll see in the exhibition. In the first tapestry, just to go through them very quickly for those of you who haven't seen the exhibition yet, you have 
the Portuguese Navy, the Portuguese ships, 400 ships, 30,000 men, landing at the coast of Asila. The soldiers, the prince, fully armored, are rowed across um, the harbor and onto shore. Not all of them make it. There's a great scene of people drowning in the waves here. They then march toward the city while the inhabitants just sit there and wait. Having withstood a Portuguese invasion once before, they're confident they can do so again. There's no reason to meet the Portuguese in battle. Of course, any slide of these uh, tapestries has no way of conveying the scale and the richness of them. For that, you're going to have to go see the exhibition. In the second tapestry, having landed, the Portuguese left their ships out there in the harbor, have marched around the back of the city, have set up this palisade to protect their camp, and they are putting the city to siege, firing guns and cannons while the king, in his fantastic armor, looks on. After three days of this um, bombardment, it's time to invade the city. The walls have been broken. Other soldiers are setting up wooden ladders to go over the walls. Um, fighting was fairly fierce. The battle was won. The Portuguese take the city of Asila. Interestingly, there's no tapestry that shows them victorious. By the time these tapestries were made, everyone knows they're going to win. And what is interesting to represent is the heroic deeds of taking them. But then for the fourth tapestry in the set, the uh, conquest of Tangier, you have a very different kind of view where there is no fighting. The people of Tangier, the Tangerines as we call them, um, really, um, have known that there was no hope of withstanding the Portuguese advance. There are no uh, uh, troops coming to help reinforce the city. So they leave the city in advance of the Portuguese arrival. And we see at the center of the tapestry a man erecting the Portuguese flag. Now, the unusual step in all of this is the decision to commission tapestries virtually right after the event. Generally, people commission tapestries that show scenes from ancient history, biblical scenes, mythological scenes. Never before had tapestries been used really to report an event that had just happened. Now, I know all, some of you at least are thinking, what about the Bayou tapestries recording the Norman invasion uh, uh, of England? Those. First of all, not really tapestries, but that's a whole other story. But more to the point, are done 20 years later, by which time that story was known to everyone. The written histories, the chronicles had established the myth. In the case of the Pastrana tales, the, in the case of the Pastrana tapestries, these happened so quickly, within a couple of years, that for most of the people at the Portuguese court, it's the tapestries that are going to fix the scene, that are going to tell everyone or fix the image of the scene in everyone's mind. They don't write history, but they do help codify it. They help depict it. They help invent the history, you could say. This is a radical step. Um, it marks a, uh, maybe in a way a kind of beginning of a Renaissance way of looking at the world, even though they come out the legacy of medieval tapestries. But it's something very special, and it makes these tapestries important from a purely historical perspective alone. That's without looking at the great success, the great quality of the weavers and everything else that goes into it. Of course, it's not an absolutely accurate history, but a sanitized and glorified version. But history is written by the victors, as we all know, or some other cliche. Um, and again, I'll leave that more intricate discussion to our next speaker. Because what I also want to do is talk about the story behind the exhibition, to discuss the campaign of conservation that's ultimately responsible for bringing the tapestries here. And that discussion of the conservation of the Pastrana tapestries will tie in nicely, I hope, with Will Chandler's discussion of one of the Museum of Art's own tapestries, one that's had, I think it's fair to say, a significantly harder life than the Pastrana tapestries have, but which helps to help, will help us to understand what tapestries are, how they're used, what happens to them, how they're changed over time, and in a way, uh, show as a foil how miraculously the state, how miraculous the state of preservation of the Pastrana tapestries is. And then finally, following from the conservation and planning discussion, I'm going to move on to talk about the question that everyone wants to know, which is how do you hang a 13 by 36 foot tapestry? 
Um, uh, so I'll offer a kind of peek behind the scenes at the risk of giving a more academic discussion of tapestries, the history of tapestries, how they relate to other things. I'm going to instead talk about the thing that it seems everyone really wants to hear um, and give you a picture show of the installation. Before that, though, I want, even at the risk of repeating points that at least a few of you heard in the lecture I gave last night, talk about tapestries in general and what's different about tapestries. As regular museum visitors, I think we're all very comfortable looking at paintings and sculptures, but we don't have that frame of reference for tapestries. Generally, you see a painting, and you can remember back to your art history intro survey class or some book you've read and figure out, oh, this is a kind of Renaissance or Baroque painting. You understand where things fit in. You know what to look for. Tapestries, though, don't work the same way. Um, and we don't have a history of them. I said last night, in my however many years on the way to a doctorate in art history, I never once had a professor talk about a tapestry in a class. Likewise, when you see tapestries in museums, with very few exceptions, they're not the focus of the exhibition or the focus of the installation, but are more often hung behind the sofa and next to the silver terrines in a decorative arts display, and they're somewhat lost. They're not the primary objects. This is a slightly weird inversion, because for most people of the Middle Ages or Renaissance or even the Baroque era, tapestries were the main event. They were everywhere. They were recognized to be the most important and the most expensive works of art. You couldn't go to a ceremony in a medieval palace without having tapestries surround you. And you see this again and again, for example, in manuscript depictions of the time. So here, a 15th century manuscript roughly contemporary with the Pastrana tapestries, where we have Richard II um, surrendering his crown. And you see in the background uh, of the event tapestries hanging from the walls. You could alternately look at something like Henry VIII's Great Hall, um, where uh, you know, perhaps second only in importance to the deer heads lining the walls, the tapestries are what are there um, and, and are, the scene, are the works of art about which Henry was most in, uh, concerned, for which he paid the most money, for which, in which he was the most interested. Um, even in the Baroque era, long, these long attendance halls outside the throne room, you would find the great deeds of the king, the history of war, uh, themes like this stretched out in these long, not straightforward narratives, but themes that were meant to be taken in over time. These are not something you see once in a museum and pass on. They're works to be lived with. They're works to be experienced. They're works where you recognize the story, but then find more and more detail. There's a richness, generally, to tapestry, which is absent from painting. It operates differently. Tapestries more than paintings are the work par excellence for demonstrating the princely virtue of magnificence. Magnificence, which is, is sort of defined as something like the public demonstration of power and wealth through lavish and tasteful expenditure, which is saying a lot. Um, what this means, though, is when you're visiting the king, on your way in, you've walked through this this hallway, and it's lined with tapestries. And then the throne room is lined with tapestries. And you're seeing these works, and you're meant to recognize, one, the great wealth of the ruler. Tapestries are expensive. Also, though, the taste, the importance of, of the arts for this person. He's not just bought up plain, everyday hangings, but hangings that have generally been designed for the space, uh, to, to hangings that, whether they have contemporary history or some allegorical Oracle tale are meant to tell you something about the ruler. Tapestries that, at least by the Baroque era, would have been woven at the royal tapestry works of Mortlake in England or Gobelin in France or something like this. They're the work, they're as rulers, the Medici dukes, as they found an academy of art for painting, they found a tapestry work. The same pattern repeats in France. The years then, the, then when the academy is founded, the same years when the tapestry works. Um, come into being in Paris. The two go hand in hand. If, an art, if a ruler has artistic ambitions, he inevitably wants tapestries as the, the paragon of that uh, display. So why are tapestries so unfamiliar to us now? Well, as I alluded to earlier, part of it has to do with the distinction that's made in modern scholarship between the fine arts and the decorative arts. 
Um, tapestries are the background rather than the main event. This has partly to do with their necessarily collaborative nature. Generally, you have one person who designs the tapestries. He hands over full-scale cartoons, full-scale drawings of the scenes to a weaver. And usually, you also have to have some kind of financier or producer. When we look at these works, we don't necessarily recognize the industry the, the, that goes into them. And again, this idea of magnificence, to, for a ruler to get tapestry, he has to have quite a command of resources available. For example, in the case of the Pastrana tapestries, we have a designer working in Portugal who sends a cartoon, probably a big linen panel with a drawing on it, to modern day Belgium, where it is woven in wool that would have come from England or Spain and silk that would have come from Italy or the Islamic Kingdom of Granada, by a team of weavers who had to work side by side and all weave at the same tension so that you don't wind up with runs and loose areas of the tapestry, using wool that is so consistently dyed in advance of the whole set being done that there's no variation in the blue color or the red color from one to the other side of the tapestry or from one tapestry to the next in the set. There's a huge amount of engineering and resource management that goes into the construction of these things, which I think helps explain both their cost and why they were deemed to be such impressive works for a ruler to put up there on the walls. Um, one of the classic examples to give a sense of the cost difference, Michelangelo was paid 5,000 ducats for the entire ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The tapestries that line the wall, or that occasionally line the wall, and when, when they do get put up, it's a reason to bring out the television cameras, evidently. The tapestries designed by Raphael, woven again in Belgium, cost 16,000 ducats, over three times the cost of the frescoes on the ceiling. And yet, while everyone in this room has gone and looked at the ceiling, most of you, on the way to the chapel, will have walked straight through the room in which the tapestries hang, not having any context for appreciating them, not really knowing these are Raphael, but they're woven in Belgium. How does this all fit together? I can see a few of you nodding. I mean, and, and I'm guilty of that as well. Um, you know, I, I, I'm primarily a paintings person. Um, it's an acquired taste, but it's a taste that comes partly out of understanding what lies behind the construction of these works. Um, as I said, then we've learned about paintings, but paintings, especially from the 15th century onward, have generally one scene, one point of view, one organized space shown in one point perspective. All those lessons that Leon Battista Alberti teaches, uh, which carry forward, which, we're learned, uh, which we learn in school as the way of looking at paintings, um, doesn't work for tapestries. In the first of the Pastrana set, for example, you see the king and the prince multiple times. First arrived, well, they probably were down here at the bottom in the arrival of the ships, but it's cut off now. Um, they're in a boat here being rowed to shore and then marching again uh, a little bit later in the tapestry, these kind of sequential narratives. It's more like a film um, than a single codified view such as we'd expect in a painting by the 1470s. And perhaps most of all, tapestries, and I think you have a very good sense of this already in looking at these images, are miserable, miserable objects in reproduction. A single view so shrinks the thing down, you know, something even on a huge screen like this, the 36 foot wide tapestry is so shrunken down that half of you probably can make out nothing that's going on in here. If you see a detail, though, it's taken out of context and, and is hard to read. You don't understand what you're seeing here. It doesn't look like a little vignette, like a mini painting. And then you have to remember that this is just one of a set of four or possibly six tapestries that hung together. But when you see a photo of the room, this is not our installation, this is Washington's, um, you lose any sense of of anything except maybe scale. You realize these are big, but their richness, uh, the impressive design, the complicated story is, is completely absent. And that's in a lecture where I've now shown you five or six slides of these things. Imagine trying to write about them in a book where you normally get one photograph and maybe one detail. They don't translate well. Tapestries are maybe more than anything else, including architecture, the most experiential of works of art. You don't get it until you're surrounded by them and looking at them in situ. 
Now, these tapestries live in situ, or have since the 16th century, in the little town of Pastrana, northeast of Madrid, um, uh, hardly a place ever visited even by scholars. Only in the wake of their conservation and exhibition have the Pastrana tapestries really started to come into their own. And I've had two different scholars of tapestry tell me this. You know, we knew about the unicorn tapestries, we knew about these other late medieval sets. I hadn't seen these, I, I had no idea. I mean, I'm talking major curators of tapestry, like uh, the, the curator of decorative arts and tapestry at the Getty, for example. I had no idea, she said. Or you look at Tom Campbell's fantastic tapestry in the Renaissance exhibition catalog from the Met, and there's a kind of brief passing mention of the Pastrana tapestries. And you get the distinct sense that even tapestry Tom hadn't trekked all the way out there, which is what he was called. Um, even Tapestry Tom hadn't trekked out there to Pastrana to see these works hanging in that church. They have been somewhat under the radar until uh, very recently, except with their conservation and the exhibition, immediately everything is changing and their great importance and their great qualities being recognized. Now, what does this conservation mean? How was it done? Um, what goes into restoring a tapestry? All tapestries have multiple campaigns of restoration. They get dirty, they get spilled on, uh, they get ripped. Um, moths love old wool. Actually, moths love new wool um, more than old wool. Um, mice get into them, uh, as often as not when they're folded up, because your average tapestry was not shown continually, but was brought out for certain special occasions. When they're folded up in the storeroom, they make nice uh, uh, habitat for, for mice. Um, they get folded, they get dragged from place to place, they get hung. And the worst part in the life of a tapestry is the moment when it's being lifted up onto the walls. It puts so much stress on these things. Um, that it, it probably does more damage than hanging for 10 years would do. The Pastrana tapestries must have had some old doc, uh, documented or undocumented restorations and reworkings, but we know of two major campaigns. The first of which happened in 1950, and the one that just happened last year. Now, the tapestries came to art historical attention for the first time when they were shown in the 1929 Ibero-American Fair in Seville, a kind of world's fair. Um, and, and immediately, they were recognized as being among the greatest works of art in Spain, so that when the Civil War breaks out, they're protected. They're put on a kind of cultural patrimony list. Make sure nothing happens to these. These are among our greatest treasures. After the Civil War and then World War II and the ensuing rough years of economic times, the tapestries finally are restored at the Royal Tapestry Works in Madrid in 1950. That restoration fixed a lot of the old holes and cleaned them, but it turned out to have been somewhat disastrous because the reweaving, the repairing of holes, was done with brand new wool. And the grease and keratin in that wool attracted moths. So they were repaired, they were sent back to Pastrana, and immediately there was a major infestation. And those moths then started eating the new, the repair wool, and then continued out into the older wool as well. Um, there is really no way of predicting this, um, uh, but restoration does as much damage as good to tapestries, just as it often does for paintings or sculpture as well. In 2010, though, um, uh, we understand now at the prompting of our second speaker, the tapestries were brought back into, cons into consideration for conservation. And interestingly, they were not done at the works in Madrid, but were instead sent to the Royal Manufacturers de Witt in Belgium. They returned back to where they were made, to this major workshop that has um, been in operation for hundreds of years, and which is one of the central places for restoration. What they found was um, somewhat dis disheartening, um, but not surprising. The tapestries riddled with holes and other problems. The areas woven with silk threads were especially fragile because the silk areas were not rewoven in the 50s because of the cost of silk being prohibitive. Um, some of the dyes used to color the threads actually continue to eat through the threads over time. There were these rips. They were dirty. You see the tide lines. This is something having been spilled on the tapestry somewhere along the way. Um, those of you who go on a tour of a royal palace in England um, can uh, only imagine what happens when the queen's corgis go running through all the tapestry-lined halls. Um, 
there are degraded fibers, partly through abrasion, partly through the effect of light. Um, the tapestries also are all more or less shredded along their top edge. This is not surprising. When you look at an illustration like this from the Tres Richers of the Duke of Berry, you see how the tapestries were basically nailed to the wall at intervals. Now imagine these tapestries, which weigh hundreds of pounds, pulling on those nails. Eventually, the nails rip through the tops. And so you see, for example, looking at the top margin of the landing, you see these blue clouds that fly behind the banner. Here's a detail of that. You see how the top just gets shredded over time. So what do you do to fix a tapestry? Well, the first thing you do is you put them in what's called an anoxia chamber, a chamber in which nitrogen is pumped in to replace the oxygen. Um, a friend of mine who's a conservator likes to call this machine the bugulator. For 60 days, the tapestries were put into one of these bubbles, not this one, a larger one. 60 days so that not only are the live moths killed, but any eggs that were remaining in the tapestries after 60 days of no oxygen could not survive. So you've basically exterminated the tapestries to begin. At this point, you have to strip off the old linings, which you see were in pretty rough shape. This was somewhere near the, the bottom of one of the tapestries. And you see how the old lining was kind of jagged and not holding up very well itself. And by taking the lining off, you're then able more effectively to dust the tapestry, essentially vacuum it. Now this shows not a Pastrana tapestry, but another tapestry being dusted in this, you see it's a kind of clean room. They call it the quarantine room. For the Pastrana tapestry, the manufacturers do it actually spread the entire tapestry out on a flat surface and used suction just from above so that they were making sure that they were pulling the dust straight up and out of the tapestry and then evacuating it from the room so that none of that dust could get pulled sidewards into the fibers and, and be lodged there. But then they do what's really the modern innovation. They put them in this room, they clean them with what they call aerosol suction. So you've got a tapestry on a piece of foam stretched out in the room. They close the doors, you have this chamber now, and a mixture of compressed air, purified water, and a natural detergent is sprayed as an aerosol above the tapestry. But below it is a big vacuum chamber. So it's sprayed and then pulled through the tapestry, dislodging whatever dirt and dust remains in it. And this is done repeatedly, slowly. I mean, it's a minimal amount of moisture at any one time. They're then washed with deionized water, neutralized water, and then eventually slowly dried in this, in this way. Um, this is something that had never been done to these tapestries before, and that's not done to very many tapestries. This is a brand new technology. And you have to imagine the size of the room used for 13 by 36 tapestries. Um, to give you an example, those tide lines, uh, which we saw a moment ago, are gone completely. They simply wash away. That the, whatever was here was water soluble, hence the kind of liquid uh, lines. And through repeated passes of this aerosol suction, it could just be basically cleaned away. At this point, the tapestries go to those restoration benches. Uh, and one of the great things about this slide is the view of all of the wool dyed in the background. Um, and on the restoration benches, uh, a new lining is stitched into place. Reinforcement fabric is stitched into place. They begin to close the gaps. Now, the most recent treatment, for the most part, didn't reweave the holes. They didn't try to get threads into the warps and close the holes by weaving but instead just put patches behind them and stitch them into place. And you'll see these if you look carefully in the tapestries. And you think, well, you know, that seems sort of shoddy. Yes, when you blow it up 100 times on a 20-foot wide screen, when you're standing five feet away from the tapestry, you, it, it disappears. You simply can't notice it. And if you're 10 feet back from the tapestry, it's virtually impossible to see, even if you know where it is and you're looking for it. But ultimately, it's less harsh of a restoration than reweaving would be. Although there were other areas, such as this one I showed before, where the solution was, um, for different reasons, adopted to not just patch a hole but weave things in. Partly because the wefts, I mean, the warps are still intact here. Um, if you put a patch, you would have two different colors of thread matching. So here, uh, weaving was done, 
not with wool that's going to attract a new infestation of moths, I think it bears pointing out. Um, the tops are then repaired. We saw this hole a moment ago, and you see how a neutral blue color. There's no attempt to reconstruct clouds. You don't know exactly what the form would have been. So a neutral blue color is stitched in place. And this is why when you look at the tops of the tapestries, it's slightly cut off by the screen here, but you see clouds up at this edge, and then it becomes solid blue. Um, this is modern restoration. You'll recognize that. And it's more obvious in some of the other tapestries where much of the whole top had been lost. Um, and you have this neutral band of red up there instead. Having been cleaned, I'll go back to this for a moment, um, the tapestries are outside of Pastrana. They're in Belgium. And this gives birth to the idea of an exhibition tour. They should now be shown in Belgium to celebrate the restoration. Well, and while they're out, why don't we send them back to Lisbon as well for where they were made? And since they're Spanish tapestries and no one goes to Pastrana, why don't we show them in Madrid as well? So they're, uh, they go out on this tour, a tour that's also meant to publicize the restoration and fr quite frankly to raise money to cover the cost, the substantial cost of the restoration. The exhibition was so successful that the National Gallery of Art was then approached uh, with the idea of organizing, National Gallery of Art in Washington was approached with the idea of organizing an American tour for these uh, tapestries as well. And the director of exhibitions there, Dodge Thompson, contacted us thinking, well, with your great collection of Spanish art, um, there's a kind of natural link for your audience with these works, and they would just look great in your building. So of course, we immediately said yes. Similarly, they went to the Meadows Museum in Dallas, which also has this great connection to Spanish culture. Um, it was a natural partner for this show, and it's not coincidental that we partner with the Meadows on many shows. We're two institutions with a real focus on the arts of the Iberian Peninsula. Then the task is, falls to the curators and designers of how we're going to hang these things, where we're going to hang these things. It's not very often that we're faced with the possibility and difficulty of hanging four 36-foot wide objects. There's only one room in the museum, it turns out, that has walls high enough to hang the tapestries, and it's our great exhibition gallery. But that's a big, wide open space, 6,000 square feet with one uh, perimeter wall. And all the interior walls move around from time to time. They're also only 10 feet wall, our typical interior walls, the movable segments we use. So we had to construct special walls. So how do we do this? How do we want to arrange the show? And you see we had came up with a few, our designer Scott Jaffe came up with a few different schemes of how we might show these. Um, we eventually settled on this one. Um, you see in this nice bird's eye view um, done in an AutoCAD program. And even here, we were still anxious enough about fitting these things in and being, making sure that we could light them effectively from the lighting tracks. Um, the CAD design was taken and made into a, a kind of 3D rendering. And then this, which almost looks like a photograph of the scene, but is in fact done in a computer program based on the measurements of our space. We felt confident that we could, in fact, fit the tapestries. Um, there's not a lot of room to spare, but we did manage to get them into place. We settled on an organization, began building the walls, prepping the walls. And then finally, uh, about three weeks ago, the tapestries arrived. They're shipped, rolled up in great big, long, long tubes in these long crates here. That's not a tapestry. Um, this is one of the tapestry crates and it extends. Um, this is not some kind of Mark Rothko design. Um, there's simply no reason to spend money on paint to cover walls that would be hidden behind tapestries. You see already the room is being prepped for the installation. There is plastic cloth being set out on the floor. Everyone's wearing these booties. It looks a bit like some uh, scientific uh, institution. And these great boards up here, the black part of the board is actually strips of Velcro nailed into place. Um, and this is what would support the tapestries. Taking the tapestries out of their boxes, now you can see how uh, the size of the boxes, and we begin rolling them out on these uh, plastic sheets on the floor. Um, and this is a combination of our installations crew and two conservators from the National Gallery who came out to help us with this process. 
Having unrolled the entire tapestry, and you see it's got Velcro on its topmost edge, as well as these strips, they take a special tube that they've devised. And the tube has Velcro of the opposite. I can't remember which one's hook and which one's loop at the top. And we re-roll the tapestries onto this installation tube so that the Velcro would grab the hanging Velcro and help support the tapestry as we lift that tube up. The tube is then secured, uh, tying straps around it. Here's the Velcro edge up here. It's spun around, and you see here this dolly on wheels with a great big spool coming out of it. This wheeled dolly is then inserted into the end of that tube. Then it gets exciting. Because now you have a 13-foot tapestry on a 14-foot tube on a wheeled dolly that you need to get upright so you can move it for installation. Um, these are great action shots. I only put two of them in, but I, you know, there's a sequence of about 20 of them as the thing very slowly is lifted upright. Um, it's wheeled over to the wall, and now the lift comes in. And tapestry is able to be moved. It's supported on this tube. The Velcro holds it tight so it doesn't begin sliding down off the tube. A little bit is unrolled, and the Velcro at the back edge is attached to the Velcro at the top of the wall. And slowly it's unrolled and tacked down, and slowly unrolled and tacked down. While traditionally the hanging is the worst part of the life of the tapestry, here at least the entire tapestry is continually supported. Um, it also is remarkably efficient because this method of unrolling, the tapestry really sets out flat. We didn't have to do much adjusting of it to, to fix the drape once it's up there. And eventually, uh, you have two tapestries on the wall, and then you have to face the thought of going through it all again two more times. Um, and there you have an exhibition, minus the graphic material, um, uh, but minus the great education area that we put in the back, which you'll all see. But uh, it's a major work. It's not quite as, as, as extensive as weaving the tapestries in the first place. But mounting the exhibition, mounting this exhibition, took considerably more planning and logistical work um, uh, than a typical painting exhibition would do. But we think the effect um, is, is worth all of the labor. So that ends my presentation. Um, we're already, not surprisingly, every symposium that's ever been done falls behind schedule. Um, it is, at least according to the clock on the podium here, 1040. I think we'll take just a 10-minute break and be back here at 1050 for our next speaker. Thank you. <laughs>